but I told, I called my dad. I was like, guess what we're doing? You know, guess what I just did? And like, I'm, I think I should just retire right now because there's no, like, what are we going to do? Like, realistically, like right now, who are we going to work with? That's bigger than Bootsy Collins, right? At this moment, like, it's cool to dream big, but holy shit, if you're going to get any bigger than Bootsy Collins. How many takes do we get? As many as we need. But God, we can <laughs> stop and change. Yeah, it does, it that's doesn't not, really that's matter. That's not the goal. All right, so this is episode 10. Oh, Mitch is on the other side of the camera. Know, He's so feeling weird. it, too. Do you want me to, you want me to introduce <laughs> I love it? it. Hi, this is uh, Matt Legro, Mitch's brother. Uh, this is episode 10 of Fretboard TV. Mitch is really nervous. <laughs> I'll do it. All right, here we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 10 of Fretboard TV. This week's episode features myself along with my brother here, Matt. My name is Mitch Legro. This is Matt Legro. And behind the camera, we've got Chris Ellison, our sales manager. Uh, he's going to be directing and moderating the episode today. So happy you can join us and enjoy. So Mitch, we're talking about you today. So before I go into your backstory, I just want to tell the people what you do here at Fretboard real quick. My, my title is The Hype Man because we all have music-themed uh, titles. But that pretty much entails uh, marketing graphic design and photography, and I manage social media for the brewery. Prior to coming to Cincinnati, give us a little bit about your backstory and kind of, you know, what you were doing before you came to this town. And So uh, I was born and raised in Syracuse, New York, upstate New York, as well as Matt was. I lived there till I was about 26, but my work history from about the age of 17 while I was in high school was, I had some weird jobs. I tested fire hoses, uh, pressure tested fire hose as a summer gig for about five years. And then my uh, school year a job was, I worked with kids at an after school program. I was a counselor, helping with homework or playing on the playground or in the gym, all that kind of stuff. Then from there, after I graduated college, uh, I went to school for graphic design. After that, I ended up working in a sign shop doing uh, graphic design and doing screen printing, digital printing. Did that for about four years until I was 26. Then things happened in my life where I decided that I needed a change, left my job, had about two weeks off in between, decided to visit Matt in Cincinnati, loved it, and then on a whim, moved to Cincinnati. Yeah, it was so, really quick. It was super quick. What brought you to Cincinnati in the first place, Matt? I moved to um, or when did you come? Columbus. I, I moved to Columbus in 2006 uh, okay. after graduating from college to join a small restaurant company that had its birth in, in 2004 in the short north. And in 2015, we were opening another restaurant in Liberty Center um, up in Westchester. And my wife and I moved to uh, the Cincinnati area to be a part of that restaurant opening and um, had a lot of responsibilities. Uh, getting the restaurant open and, and, and needed a lot of help. And Mitch was, you know, in limbo and looking for uh, you know, a new start and uh, came out to visit us for a couple of days. And ironically enough, the apartment right next door to where we lived was available for rent, which was like a, a totally weird uh, crazy timing. Crazy, yeah. It was. It was like, well, okay. Well, I guess you could just live right there. Um, because the idea of moving to Cincinnati was, yeah, it was a big jump. But the idea that he could move to Cincinnati and and literally be right next door to us was uh, was kind of a cool thing. Um, Mitch and I did not spend a lot of time uh, together as adults. You know, we sort of. I, I, I left the house when I was. Uh, 18 years old and you know Mitch and I had always been close but never really knew each other as adults. There's a six and year age gap between the two of us. That was gonna be my next question. Yeah. 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 So yeah. he you know he graduated from high school I was still in middle school so growing up you know as kids we weren't doing the same things right. It was super cool to have him uh, have him right next door. Yeah it was like a show you know brother just walks in the back door of the house whenever he wants like you know the door was sort of always <laughs> open like yeah you know, we'd be in the living room hanging out and you just hear hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you know, Mitch just lets himself in because you know he's got nothing going on next door by himself. So he's right, you know right. he just invites himself over. So it was it was it was cool. It was super cool. Yeah. And then he moved away. <laughs> you know, you go you go from like having your brother who's single, and um, you know has has nothing going on. He's like totally available whenever you want to hang out. And then he finds a girlfriend who's got a dog. And then all of a sudden he moves in with her, and he's just not got available. Uh, so I lost my best friend uh, to a woman. <laughs> yeah. uh, they all grew up sometime, right? 
So, you know, we're talking about this restaurant. What What's the restaurant that we're talking about here? Yeah, the restaurant's called North Star Cafe. We, a small little restaurant in the middle of the Short North Arts District. Um, it was a little bit of ahead of its time. Uh, the North Star, or I'm sorry, the Short North was, you know, filled with galleries and, and fast food. You know, there wasn't a lot of uh, restaurants uh, who were doing uh, what we were trying to do, you know, sort of this farm to table movement, um, local organic food. We were trying to recreate what the West Coast had been doing for decades before us. And, you know, it sort of, it, it blew up quickly. We opened our second restaurant in 2007, so on and so forth. Right now, at this point, we've got 10 restaurants. Um, we've well, one here uh, in, in Liberty Center. We have a restaurant in Cleveland, uh, but the rest of our restaurants are in, um, in Columbus. And when we opened this restaurant in Cincinnati, it was sort of uh, a rebirth of uh, the brand. You know, we were introducing a whole new market to what we do, and um, it was a big responsibility to come uh, to Cincinnati and share our culture with, uh, with not only a whole new group of uh, guests, but uh, a group of team members who had to sort of carry the torch and, and, and move the brand forward. You know, when we were opening the restaurant, trying to find great people, um, we quickly realized that, you know, Mitch, although he had never worked in a restaurant before, was just a natural people person and was able to, um, you know, strike up a conversation with a random stranger, although he's a little nervous to be in front of the camera now when he's behind the bar serving beers and cocktails. It's like uh, he, was a, he was a natural. Um, and so it was great to have his maturity and his leadership there. And he really helped us uh, take that restaurant uh, from the start to a really good spot when he ended up you know, taking this position with you guys. I was the old man of the front of the house. What was your favorite part about working there? Uh, that camaraderie, honestly. I, I felt like every time I went into a shift, even if I would get stressed out or something, you know, and, and obviously I show it very much so on my face if I'm having a bad day, right? But all those kids would make my day, like working working alongside them and, you know, us just kind of lifting each other up and, and matching each other's energies, you know, was, was something special because they all have great work ethics there. How was the food? Food was delicious. And then, of course, you know, I, I met Chris at, uh, at North Star. Well, I tell you... Th- you know what you're you're saying it it resonates and it, with the customers too the customer can feel those types of connections between a staff when you walk in and that's one thing that i can say you know when i first walked in there the place felt very warm and kind um i remember everybody was super friendly i sat down at the bar and and then next thing you know i'm talking to mitch and he, the nicest guy in the world and it just it just seemed like everybody there was connected yeah in so that place. chris and i bonded i mean he would come in try to sell beer it was the beginning of fretboard uh, how, roughly how long do you think you guys have been open fretboard had been open when you not were very long so just a couple months probably right yeah 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 we and were very new to the market so at that point i had moved into a position at north star where i was buying the beer i thought that was pretty awesome because then i was able to have the interactions with beer salesmen but then kind of make decisions myself you know, to say this, this would go well with our food and blah, blah, blah. You know, but when Chris came in, Chris was, I would say Chris and uh, Christy from Rheingeist were my two favorite salespeople to talk to because they weren't pitching beer so much as they were pitching their personalities and just like, it was an honest approach to salesmanship, right? And so Chris and I would connect on all sorts of stuff, music related. And that's kind of how I was like, all right, let's give the beer a shot. You know, we were a new company around that time too, and you have to have good branding and you have to have a good team of people to work on those types of things to help build your brand. And, um, you know, I always felt like we could be doing a better job with some of that. I I was doing some ride-alongs with one of our owners, Kevin Moreland, and I wanted to introduce Mitch to some of the people on our team here. And, you know, I explained to Kevin that I think Mitch is got some great talent and he might have some things to offer. And so we came in and we sat down and we, we ordered some beers and we talked about some beers and I kind of, <laughs> I kind of let those two beers. just, what's that? <laughs> so it was more than just some beers. You know, yeah. Like... We, we hung for, we hung for a while and it, you know, it was, it was a blast. It was yeah. a blast. And I remember, you know, I'll let you talk about that day and what they, that day means to you. But... Well, I think about it. It's another one of those instances of perfect timing. Like we talked about me finding an apartment, right? Like the timing was crazy on that. But the timing was crazy on this whole situation, too, that I was able to have basically an hour long uninterrupted conversation with you and Kevin that day without any other guests really sitting at the bar during that time slot. So we paid him for a full hour yeah, to do nothing but talk to you guys. That's great. Can I get reimbursed through like a few more beers today? Well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Kevin basically said, Hey, you know, we've got this beer coming out called Juicy Improv. It's a, it's a grapefruit version of our flagship IPA improv. Um, and he gave me the opportunity to illustrate a poster for the draft release of that beer. What I think is pretty interesting is how much of a turn the artwork has taken, but it was basically a play of Jerry Garcia and his glasses. And then there was like the Pink Floyd prism, you know, light prism going through. And then out, out of the other glass was like a grapefruit, you know, and going into the beer. It was, and it was all geometrical and stuff. And now, you know, it's totally different. That was the very first project that Kevin said, Hey, why don't you do this for us? Uh, you're not hired yet. Right. But let's see how this goes and see what the reception is. And the reception was awesome from not only the fretboard team, but it sounded like, you know, people on social media were really enjoying it. And uh, that kind of spurred everything else on which is really cool so it wasn't to me it wasn't so much about the beer as it was about the music when it came to the design aspect of it so yeah so 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 both of you what, what's your talk to me about your introduction to craft beer and how you got into drinking craft beer and what you kind of started with and where you're at now i want to hear his introduction to beer in general yeah you know my introduction to like beer was old. i don't know was, i think i was drinking rolling rock uh and the owner of north star kevin who's you know like he's like my older brother i was the oldest of six the um i remember him making fun of me because i was drinking rolling rock we went out like to the bar for the very first time when i had first moved to columbus and uh, this was in 2006 and he was drinking sam smith's organic lager yeah sam smith's gets a lot of love on these sam episodes smith's. Yeah. so uh I remember just being like, okay, I have a lot to learn. So I was drinking early on. I was drinking like I think everybody. He was you know, drinking whenever. early on. I'm going to make it sound like Yeah, that. I was drinking, you know, from a very <laughs> young age. Um, <laughs> I think you, you, you're like you, you grasp on to things that are, are big. And so I was drinking big beers. I was drinking a heavy, high, like like high, high ABV yeah. IPAs because I felt like if I was going to spend nine ninety nine or ten ninety nine for a six pack, it needed to be uh, worth its weight in gold, and uh, I wanted it to be an experience. You know, my wife and I love food and we love cooking, and uh, it was it was important that the beer or the cocktail or the bottle of wine sort of matched the quality, uh, the, of, the the... quality of the food that yeah. we were preparing, and so there was no like there was no delicate palate. It was just sort of like. Let's wreck our pedal with hops before we eat this fish. <laughs> right. right. So my introduction came from him, I would say. Primarily, you you and our, I have a stepbrother named Matt as well, so not to be confused. Uh, but Matt is a huge um, craft beer geek and still is to this day. He's always drinking something interesting that I've never seen before back in New York. But I would say some some of my first memories are Southern Tier. Uh, I love their double IPA. Their 2X IPA is probably my favorite. And then uh, Breckenridge 471, though. Matt came home with this imperial ipa i believe it's an imperial ipa it's at least a double ipa something along those lines it's like eight eight and a half percent eight point seven percent matt comes home with a four pack of this comes back to syracuse from columbus to, to share this with me i'd never had a beer so heavy in my life i think i had one or two of them when i was drunk i was 21 and I, you know i i never really drank before i was old enough to actually legally drink and uh that just knocked me off my feet so Mitch, you're the hype man at Fretboard and what exactly does that mean to you and what are some of your earliest memories of doing work here at Fretboard? Because you've done a lot since you've been here. The first day that I can really remember was our one year anniversary. Uh, we had Blackfoot Gypsies come up. Chris, you actually booked those guys that, right? You, you brought them up here? Yeah. So from uh, Nashville. And um, it was the first show that I'd taken pictures at for Fretboard. We had just installed the Miles Davis illustration that's up on the wall in the tap room, maybe a couple days prior to that. There it is. Wow. Okay. And uh, <laughs> and it was a really cool feeling to see to see my artwork as big as that is um, for the first time in my life. I've never had something created almost 20 feet tall. And so I'm here hanging out, taking pictures, having a blast. The pictures are looking great. That whole situation, the whole team was here. I was being introduced to new people, you know, who are who work in the brewery that I'd never met before and people in, you know, in the offices that I'd nev never met before because it was just you and Kevin at the time. It was really, I was welcomed with open arms and it was awesome energy. The place was packed. Uh, it was just a blast to to feel like I was wanted. Not that I wasn't wanted at North Star, but I wasn't, I wasn't welcomed with these like, you know, like, hey, this is great. We have you on the team. You know, you, you don't so. feel like that was, you didn't get that. Really? 
We just got to talk about all this, all the craft cocktails you got to make at his house. Well, they I mean, me, I mean, yeah, and they let me name a beer too. That the Miles Davis illustration stemmed from being able to name a beer. Like as soon as I started here. So, so if we had let you name like a burrito, <laughs> you would have been totally in. I would have been bought in if I could name a burrito <laughs> in North Star. So Mitch, you did start talking a little bit about your your approach to social media. What really is your your approach to the branding on social media and consistently what you're trying to accomplish with that currently? Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about branding. I didn't start the branding here at Fretboard. That was established when I came in a year later, but I feel like I've taken it to a to another level in regards to one, it's consistency. When we're talking about cans and things like that and can artwork, but also uh, like uh, we needed a brand slogan, for instance, right? And so there was nothing established. Kevin comes in from a place of brewing quality German beers, you know, true to style. And so his his whole thing was the home of Cincy Brow, which is awesome. I use that as a hashtag. Cincy Brow is, is one of our bigger uh, hashtags that I use. But I thought Bruise in Tune was kind of cool because what that implies is that there's that music reference of something being in tune, but when it's tuned in, you know, you, you find tune tune something the beer is fine tuned it took that and then it became you know finely tuned in blue ash ohio and things i thought those were kind of cool small things that will separate us from just saying you know proudly brewed in cincinnati it's a different take on it trying to think of those small things that'll add up over time and people will start to separate us from the pack in a sense and recognize us taking the ohio logo that had the we call it the dot slash dot which are the frets you know on a guitar Taking that symbol and merging it, we had two things that were already established. We had that Ohio, and then we had this pick logo that was just a flat pick that said FBC Blue Ash Ohio in it. And I was like, why don't we merge those two things together? Because if we're going to have a secondary logo, we don't need to have two of them. And so all those little things where I'm like, let's just knock this down. Let's simplify it. Uh, that was important to me um, from the jump. So I started with a lot of that stuff. And then uh, I thought our photography could use some improvement. We could incorporate more more of the acts on stage, which wasn't necessarily happening so much, all the live music, you know. So really just trying to tie all those things together because before I started on the team, we weren't incorporating any of the music stuff. I mean, we were through the names of the beers and things of that nature, but it just wasn't, you weren't under, if you weren't here to see it, you never would understand it. I try to make posts that feel like they might be from an old record or something like that. You know what I mean? Like photographs that have a little age to them or whatever, just to, just to give our brewery that nostalgia feel you know, that mu musical nostalgia. I think, I think you've done a great job with all of it. Um, Thanks, man. And, you know, you just said give it a musical feel too. That's just, that's right in your wheelhouse as well. And I'm looking at a t-shirt that you designed for somebody and, yeah. you know, I'd love to hear more about some of those things. Uh, I'm currently wearing a t-shirt for my buddy, Homeboy Sandman. He is a uh, MC out of New York City, who I've become friends with over time just because we have mutual friends back in Rochester, New York, Anthony Moses Rockwell and uh, Hassan Mackey, two MCs that I got to know starting in around 2009 because I would go to shows and take pictures. I didn't know them, but I just loved the music and the scene in Rochester was it existed versus Syracuse, which doesn't exist. So I would have to travel about an hour and a half to the West in New York to um, go to these shows, these underground hip hop shows. And I would bring my camera and I would just show up and take pictures and offer them the pictures, the digital files, you know, to do whatever the hell they wanted with. And over time, that kind of just built this relationship where they realized I was a graphic designer, you know, and so I met a lot of people in that circle in Rochester. And um, Sandman, I hadn't met him for probably four years and I'd, I'd been doing some work for him. Like I would just illustrate stuff and send it to him. It wasn't, wasn't even for him. It was just, I like to draw stuff and here's some work that I did and it caught his attention. And over the past, you were fan arting. I was fan arting. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I forced myself into this friendship that, uh, that exists and it's hey, pay attention to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a huge fan, right? And so like lyrically he's he's one of my favorite MCs of all time. And uh the fact that he was, you know, one one person removed from Kevin Bacon, whatever the hell is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, it was, he was close, right? So I was able to get this stuff to him and be like, Hey, if you ever need anything, reach out, you know, I'm not going to charge you a million dollars. You know, we'll, we'll, I'd love to just work with you. And so I, uh, eventually grew to me doing flyers for him, poster designs. It's gotten to the point now where I may be doing his next album cover, which is really cool. And so 
to have my name on the back of you know somebody's record in stores all across America is going to be a huge deal for me and probably one of those like peak moments that you know I, I'd be super proud to get involved with. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of those things where uh, if I if you'd t- if you'd asked me when I was 18, 19 years old what my dream job would be, I would have told you w- working as an in-house graphic designer for a indie music label you know, like rhyme sayers or stones throw or something along those lines, because you get, you get all those jobs, you know, but you have job security. So it's not so much freelance work. It's just, here's what you're doing. But this, this job is honestly like the second best thing. I mean, I can't think of something that makes more sense for me than this. Work for an independent record label. Well, this or that is what I'm saying. Well, but how do you know that that's better than this? Exactly. I don't. They don't, they they have beer there. (laughs) They, yeah, they don't Do have, they have, they don't have beer. beer. I probably yeah, got a lot yeah. more insight into yeah. that than you. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you've done quite well. Yeah. Has Do you think Sandman's going to catch the fretboard logo in his album cover? Do you think he's going to see that design in there, or you think yeah, he's yeah. going to like? I, I hit it in there. It's just yeah. real small, a little subtle, little subtle fretboard logo yeah. in the corner there. Yeah. I don't know how it works with your non compete that you signed. Here. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, it really is kind of a perfect marriage from everything you love. You love music, you love you love the photography, you love being around the bands, you love working with the musicians. Yeah, um, that's my favorite know, part of the job. It, 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 it's great. It's, now, it's now you're it sucks right now. You're, you're helping book some of the music these days. Yeah. Um, Mitch has put together quite a few awesome shows that have come through and has really added diversity to our stage and some right. of the things that we're doing. That was my um, biggest goal, honestly, was just bringing diversity to the stage because uh, the ownership team... Uh, very much grew up in the era of rock and indie rock. Brad is obviously a big jam band fan and reggae. Um, So they had established a circle of musicians that they would bring in once, twice, three times a year uh, to fill the weekends for us. And then Franz started, you know, on the team around the same time that I did. And I think have, and when Jim said, Hey, you know, if you guys want to reach out to musicians and try to put them on stage, like we would love your input just to try to mix things up. And so Franz got a lot of awesome, like really cool jam friendly, but younger bands, you know, that are more hip in the festival scene. Right. And then my goal was to bring my style of music in, but try to transition in a way that wasn't aggressive. I didn't want to go from having a family friendly rock band that does covers in Cincinnati to an aggressive, you know, solo rapper on the stage. Right. Like those shows just don't even do well in the first place. Like it's so niche and it's it would just run people out of the room. But I brought in, you know, uh, the Jesse Lees from uh, Louisville. Uh, They're fantastic. They're more like soulful, R&B, modern, uh, younger band. And then uh, Mr. Anderson out of Columbus, they're similar to The Roots in the fact that they have an MC at the helm, but they have live musicianship behind them. And then uh, Tribe, which is one of Cincinnati's best young uh, groups. It was a trio at the time. It's a duo now but they had uh, a backing band as well. So it's one of those things that people can come in and they may not think they like the style of music, right? Like our, our normal crowd that comes in in Blue Ash, but as soon as they're sitting there drinking a beer and they hear that live instrumentation and then they just get that energy that just doesn't come from other styles of music, they're like, this is awesome. And it turns them on. Like people, people will jump up on the dance floor and we would see people that we would never expect, not to profile, but we would just see people that we would never expect get on that dance floor and then leave us comments on social media saying that they had an awesome time seeing that show. And even if it's even if it's not our busiest night, it's super rewarding because then you know that you're you're moving the needle a little bit which is great. So I love being a part of that. Like, just, That's awesome. Well, you got to work with a pretty big local celebrity here in town uh, yeah. pretty early on. So <laughs> we, we did a beer with Bootsy Collins. You want to talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So Bootsy, that project came along so quickly for us. It was kind of comical and, and totally bizarre because Joe, as you know, Chris made a phone call one day. He basically said, Hey, like no one's worked with Bootsy on the beer front, at least in Cincinnati or or anywhere that he could find. So why don't we reach out to Bootsy? He's probably the biggest name in Cincinnati. See if he'd be down to do, do a collaboration. And so at the time, you know, we had hoped that this beer would become a year round product for us. But at the time we were like, this will, we'll probably just do it and see how it runs. And once we're out, we'll go from there. Right. Joe comes into the office one day and basically says, Hey, like we need you to design a can for, for the Bootsy beer. We're going back forth on names. It was a brute IPA initially. Right. And so I was like, why don't we call it Brutesy? 
you know, and I thought I was I was slick with that one. I thought that was pretty funny. I like it. Yeah, I like it too. But ultimately, I'm really happy that we did just land on calling it Bootsy because it's recognizable. There's only one Bootsy Collins, one Bootsy in the world that people know. So it's it's, it's in your face. It's just that's who it is, right? And so I, I my initial design um, was similar to what it landed on, but it was a little bit different. So all I had to do, though, was one change, essentially. But it was one of the easiest projects that I've ever designed because Bootsy was so receptive and it was easy for us to go back and forth. And it was crazy that I was basically emailing Bootsy and his wife, Patty. You know, I'm sitting here. I'm a I'm a 30 year old. I still think I'm a kid sometimes. I'm a 30 year old adult kid talking to Bootsy Collins, who's an absolute legend, who all of my favorite musicians look up to, right? So he may not have been in my own catalog of, of stuff that I love, but I appreciate him so much because I love bass players that that looked up to him, right? And uh, P-Funk is just so massive that uh, it was really cool. So I, I designed this thing. I you know, I get the very first proof press of the label. I have it framed in my house. He signed it. You know, it's the it's the very first test. That's your one dollar bill. That's my one dollar bill. That's your one dollar bill. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, a one dollar bill. Of of opening up a new restaurant. You got a one dollar bill. <laughs> yeah, your first dollar label. Like, so, yeah. uh, but I told I called my dad. I was like, "Guess what we're doing?" You know, guess what I just did. Like, I'm. I think I should just retire right now because there's no like. What are we gonna do? Like, realistically, like right now, who are we gonna work with that's bigger than Bootsy Collins? Right at this moment like it's cool to dream big but holy shit if you're gonna get any bigger than Bootsy Collins right and so uh you know that was a joke that I was just like I think it's all downhill from here I think it's just call it a day <laughs> I'm going back to North Star and uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see you later I remember the can being very popular at North Star yeah. like when we first launched it at the, at the cafe it was uh I think all of the regular guests we have a big bar you know, I remember like there was there was a period of time when the cans first started rolling into the restaurant and, you know, Mitch was sort of on his way out. He was like on, he was like on this farewell farewell tour. You know, he was like letting everybody know that he had he's moving on to greener pastures, but he was simultaneously doing all this design work. And there were some cans there. And, um, you know, we, we were ripping cans out of the cooler and sort of like passing them around the bar so that people could sort of uh, uh, digest Mitch's art. Uh, it was super cool, uh, super cool. And then when Mitch comes into the restaurant, still, it's like uh, a local celebrity has has come back to uh, to North Star. The guests are still very interested in, in what he's doing here at the brewery, and and from an artistic and, and music standpoint. So the still the connection still lives on, even though we didn't treat you as well as they treat you here. <laughs> Chris, what's going on, bud? I, I dropped my mic. So I've got some music questions for you, gentlemen. Yes. Uh, Mitch, I just kind of like to know, you know, what kind of music you grew up on and, you know, what your family was listening to as you were growing up and, you know, how Matt's musical influences might have impacted your life and, you know, anything yeah. you can tell me about that. Sure. So some of my first musical memories are of Cool and the Gang, which was probably uh, one of my dad's, well, it was definitely in my dad's record collection, the album Emergency. I remember being this red cover with the guys all in like matching like jackets. They were the blue or black and they're like running through the tunnel and it's like red and yellow. And as a kid- What's that, the song from that album? Uh, like, what, fresh is oh, the Oh, how does song. it go? She's fresh, fresh, exciting, she yeah. loves like to me. Oh, come on. Don't worry, I'll like make my voice sound better through the post editing. <laughs> I sound exactly like he'll, those guys. He'll throw on the yeah. auto too. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, that's the song. And uh, I always wanted my dad to put that record on. So as a kid, I would say, put on the red record. I was probably four or five years old. I had no idea what the hell I was looking for. I just knew I liked that song and I knew what it looked like. So you put that on. But uh, he was a big fan of Allman Brothers, The Temptations, The Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Eric Clapton was a big one. Oh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. So mostly his stuff ranged from, you know, like classic Southern rock to uh, Motown. That was kind of his his wheelhouse. And so I yeah, was, not a lot of rock and roll. Yeah, nothing like not heavy. Like he was no never. Metal. Yeah, he gave me all of those albums. So I have the red so record, so you can come over and we can listen Perfect. to uh, the red record. It's interesting though because his style, his taste, 
he's kind of reverted to us now. You know, what you and I say, hey, you should check this out. You know, that's kind of where he's at now. I was in my mind while you were just saying that, trying to think of like where his transition was and what he listened to in the 90s. And so there was a lot of David Gray and a lot of uh, Brian Adams. Mm -hmm. um, the Brian Adams Unplugged album mm -hmm. I remember listening to on the way down to Myrtle Beach for like summer after mm -hmm. summer and on cassette he would put that in his minivan and just mm -hmm. play the that. Brian Adams Unplugged cassette I love that album to this day yeah he's a huge John Mayer fan yeah so, that, loves, that, so loves, that's kind of where he's he's at now. He, he loves the guitar. Anybody right. who can like rip it up on the guitar, he's, yeah. he's, he's into. Yeah, so he's been teaching himself guitar for, well, he's had a guitar for as long as I can remember. And now he has lots of guitars. Like, yeah, now he has lots of guitars and he's been teaching himself uh, probably more seriously over the last six, seven years than he had ever prior. Yeah, he's going to watch this. Lessons. You should say some nice things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's fantastic. I would say he's the equivalent of like, um, he's like the John, no, 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 Lindsey Buckingham. He's like uh, Lindsey Buckingham from it. Fleetwood Mac. He's basically on the same level as Lindsey Buckingham. Uh, I would say he's uh, who else? Jimmy, like Jimmy Hendrix, a little bit. You know, he's got a little bit of that. It's very good. Yeah, you mean like internally? You mean like it doesn't really translate? Yeah, it doesn't to the guitar, translate, but but in his mind, he, he's in his there. mind and in my heart, he's, yeah, there. he's there. Yeah. So, hey, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I think there was like, you know, there was a good, a lot of music that was um, being played. I mean, I grew up in uh, the Napster time. Like MP3 is like really started, um, started being like super available when I was um, in high school. Yeah, and I was really into like East Coast hip hop. Jay-Z, uh, DMX, up. the Fugees. Yeah, I remember Dragon, like middle school. Ja Rule, where is Ja? I mean, it was really like, you know, my dad wasn't into hip hop. And so for me, I was exploring a, a genre of music that, you know, I wasn't exposed to. So and it was a little bit rebellious too. And you know, for sure. it was like here's here's the here's the one piece of musical memory I have that started my dive into underground hip hop. So he kind of alluded to the whole Napster thing and, and downloading stuff, right? I I downloaded this like mixtape of just underground hip hop music that I'd never heard before. I was just like, oh, this is cool. It's not on the radio. Let's just see like what's in this folder of music that somebody put together, right? There was a song called uh, Five Star Millas by a rapper named Agala, who's from New York City, and I don't know any other song by him. So the beat, though, had a sample to an awesome Four Tops song. One of my favorite Four Tops songs is Seven Rooms of Gloom. It's a little bit more of like a darker song that they've ever sang, but it, it has its ups and downs. It's kind of, it's got this weird energy and I love it. And they sampled the song in this, in this Agala song and it blew my mind. I was, I was 12 or 13 years old. That was the first time me experiencing that. And it made me like want to seek out as much of that as possible. So all I'd done for years after that was seek out music that was had soul samples buried in them. And then I would read credits. I would buy CDs and I would read like, you know, the, the liner notes to figure out what samples got cleared and stuff. You know, like yeah, Mitch was like the first person who was teaching me how to find music that I would be interested in solely based on like who was the drummer or who played bass on the song or, you know, who produced the album, you know, before it was just sort of like, you know, you have an artist. I was seeking artists who were similar to the artists that I were already listening to. And Mitch was the first one to tell me, Hey, you know, you should, you would like this song because this guy played saxophone on this song, or this guy was the guy who played, uh, you know, the keys on, on that song, which but I it, thought was like a cool way to find music. And it worked backwards for me though, too, because I would listen to a ton of songs that I wouldn't know the sample to, but I would be so driven to figure out because a lot of the underground stuff does doesn't credit the sample, right? They didn't clear them, so they didn't have to pay for that sample. They just went and used it, hoping they would never get caught, right? And so I would play this game where I would say, what is this? Like, who does it sound like? And then I would try to backtrack to figure out what that sample was. Or like years later, I would stumble upon something that sounded familiar to that hip hop song. I'm like, oh shit, that's the sample, right? Like four years, five years later, I'm, I still do it to this day. And then it introduces me to the original music. Yeah, right. And so then I just dive into this whole section of that original artist that I'd never heard of before in their whole catalog. And it's just, it keeps compounding on itself. So, so Emmett is your cousin, is that correct? Emmett is our cousin. Emmett yeah. is our cousin. At least he says he's our cousin. We have never confirmed it. <laughs> Not um, a blood tested him or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. He's, he's a cool dude. 
Well, Emmett has a question here for you guys. Or, well, yeah, it's for you, both of us. Yeah, yeah, I think you, you can both answer. answer this question. Yeah. I think this is a good question. Yeah. If you were a tour bus driver for a musical act, who would it be and why? Do you need time for this one? Yeah, I need time. You All right. Go so I thought about this one. Um, my answer would be The Roots. So originally, I'm going to say who it originally was, but then and why it's not them anymore, because um, Maggie Rogers? Creed. Yeah, neither of those. Not Maggie Rogers or Creed. With arms wide open. Um, I don't know. I thought that's what you were saying. We should edit that out. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Um, my initial thought was uh, Alchemist, to bring it back to him, and Action Bronson. Yeah, because be Action great. Bronson yeah, is funny. hilarious, and he's a foodie. He's, yeah. he's an absolute foodie, and they would that's be a, a ton one. of fun. But yeah. I think that being the bus driver for those two would just be too distracting. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I go with the roots is for a couple, well, three reasons. One, Questlove is an absolute foodie too, right? I've read a few of his books. He's a genius in all sorts of fashions, but he, and he's a walking encyclopedia of music as much as probably anybody could possibly be. But he's very in tune with music so, or food. So I feel like we would go places and he would have all the cool restaurants to go to. And then... Two is that they have about seven or eight people in their band. So I'm sure to like actually make friends with at least one of them. And then three is that they would probably be at this point in their careers, pretty respectful. They wouldn't be doing like hard drugs on the bus, you know, so I wouldn't be distracted as a driver because I'm already probably scared of the concept of driving this big ass bus. I've never done that before. Yeah, Mitch yeah. turns his radio down when he takes a right turn so that if traffic <laughs> is coming, he can hear that. <laughs> <sighs> so yeah, there's definitely, I considered all those things. I mean, I thought about me being distracted, having to drive this big ass bus, trying to be, you know, connecting with somebody in the group and my odds, you know, so. That would yeah, be. I think I'd want it to be a, uh, a, a group that just got it start, a band that is unknown, you know, living in Columbus and having the opportunity to see a lot of new groups come through and, and play really small shows. You know, my wife and I love to see live music. I just think the energy of being able to like wake up, drive a little tiny bus. I'm thinking like, not bus, I'm thinking like little tiny van. We got a little thing hitched to the back of our van where all the, the stuff goes in there. I'm not a musician, but there's stuff that probably goes in that thing that's attached to the van. I think the work ethic when you're that new is really strong and I sort of gravitate towards that that sort of blue collar, like work really hard to sort of make it. And I think, uh, you know, sharing in their enthusiasm and excitement would be really energizing. So, so you want to be a glorified babysitter is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. You have yeah. To be the responsible As somebody one. that spent a lot you of time on the road. Drink beer, you have to like, you have to be able to drive the van. I mean, you, you need know, to my, get them to my, the van on time. You need to make sure they get their gear. Together. But like, all right. So we've got another question that we ask everybody that comes on the show. List three bands that you'd like to see on the fretboard stage they can be dead or alive who would it be it's a killer festival all right we'll go one and one and one and one and one and one how's that so they're right, not that's influenced by each other's sure. picks. go ahead immediately i went to like nirvana unplugged uh which i think would be like super cool in this environment yeah all right. he goes nirvana unplugged first off the board yeah uh my first pick in the 2020 draft i'm going with uh stevie wonder of course I got to put Stevie Wonder on stage. He's my favorite musician of all time. I don't need to explain it. He's just a genius. My second pick was, um, I'm really into Latin America. Love that culture. Love that music. And so I went with a, a Cuban band called uh, Buena Vista Social Club. Fantastic. Which I think would be like super cool. Good like, pick. Super vibey in this environment. Uh, my second pick is Fleetwood Mac. They'd be great with Stevie Wonder. Your final pick. My final pick was uh, was a tough one. Yeah, I wanted to pick different genres, and so I really I think Robert Glasper uh, would be a cool sort of like live jazzy. Uh, my final pick is Kings of Leon, mm -hmm. just because they're the, probably my favorite show that I've ever seen. You know, yeah, it was a good, yeah, it was a great show. I don't think they have any songs that miss. Those are my answers. Yeah, pick one hip hop artist. I was going to say The Roots, but then I realized, one, I'm already driving their van, so I don't need to <laughs> deal with that. All right, let's hit these rapid-fire questions. I got a couple for you, Mitch. I want to start with this one. What's the weirdest comment you've gotten on social media? So I had to think about this one. This is a great question. I went back and tried to find some examples of this, but the weirdest, the weirdest responses that I get are from Bootsy Collins' fans. That's definitely my answer. 
is that I'll post something, especially on Twitter, because he's so active on Twitter that he'll repost everything that we do. He obviously speaks a language that is just unbeknownst to most of humankind, right? But his fans, they just speak in another language. So half the time when they're responding to something, I have no clue what it actually means. And usually I think that I'm like on top of these things and I have an understanding, but Bootsy's fans are just on a different planet. So their comments are always the weirdest. Is there a Google translate for like English to Bootsy Collins? <laughs> yeah, it should be. Bootsy, you should get on that. It sounds like a business opportunity. It's for life everybody. on Planet Groove, right? Did you ever picture yourself working for a brewery? Uh, Josh from March 1st asked me this question. He's awesome too, by the way. Shout out to Josh at March 1st, buddy. Um, I didn't, honestly. I mean, when I moved to Cincinnati, my plan was to work at the restaurant and then someday become a partner in the restaurant and, you know, keep moving up the ladder there. You work with many mediums. You're a photographer. You do videography. You've got freehand drawing skills. You're marketing. If you could learn another medium for your skill set, which would it be? This is a tough question for me because I've always wanted to be good at painting. And I feel like my my graphic design and illustration style would translate well to painting, mm -hmm. but I suck at painting. And I don't know if it makes sense to learn that at this point in my life, because it's just like, what would it get me? You know, it would be more therapeutic than anything. Paint some happy little trees. <laughs> yeah, make some happy little trees. So I think my answer would be if I had the time, either keyboards or drums, I wish I was an actual musician so that that appreciation for all the music that I love is even heightened. And then one more rapid fire question. What's your favorite memory associated with your art practice? Uh, I love this question. So it's probably the first thing that really kicked me in the ass to loving working with musicians and everything that I did. So for four years of high school, I was on this message board, this hip hop database message board, where I would just talk with strangers about music, most of it being hip hop music. And uh, I got to know these guys that ran the site and they are probably 10 years older than me at this at this time. So I'm 18, they're 28 to 30 years old. They're rappers in DC. One of them's a photographer as well. So Chris, and Tyrone. They're like, hey man, like, you know, it'd be cool to meet you. Why don't you come down to DC, yeah. show you the town, and go to some shows, right? And so I tell my dad and, uh, <laughs> And so I go down to DC by myself. This is the time when Garmin's are like new, phones don't have GPS on them, but I didn't have a Garmin. So I'm looking at my, I had a piece of fucking paper to get me through DC traffic at rush hour on a Friday night. Yeah. It was brutal. It was scary as hell. I'd never driven that far by myself. And I get to DC and these guys are taking me to all these like nightclubs and lounges and stuff, you know? And so I would go to these shows. I wasn't drinking or anything, but I had just bought a camera for myself, like a real rudimentary camera. And Chris was just showing me photography skills and all the stuff that he does for like live shows. And we went to a Blueprint show. Blueprint's a MC that I love from Columbus, actually. And uh, we went and saw him. We went to a couple other shows over the course of like three nights. That really like pushed everything for me. I was just surrounded by all these people who loved that scene. And Chris was just a great mentor for probably two or three years after that trip. Yeah, I, I feel like I just grew and I just aged like another three years just in that few days. Can I say something real quick? And that's not an example of a rapid fire answer. And I'll tell you, <laughs> you're very six, right. five. You're very that was, right. a la that was the last one. That so was the last good. question. So we can, uh, we can wrap this thing up. Uh, I will tell everybody, you know, thank you so much for watching. Matt, thanks for coming out, hanging yeah. out, doing this. Chris, Thank appreciate you. you moderating this whole thing. I wouldn't have anybody else do it, bud. Super cool. So everybody, if you enjoyed the episode, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Um, make sure you subscribe. That helps us out quite a bit. Thanks again. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Chris.